Welcome back to the first lecture on path tracing. After bearing with us through light physics, Monte Carlo integration and sampling methods, it's now time to put the things we saw together and get some physically based rendering going. Our goal for today will be to move from direct lighting to full on path tracing. We will do this by putting the rendering equation, which we saw last time, into our renderer and implement it as a recursive function. To arrive at a high quality solution, we will also go over the most important concepts and optimizations to make our implementation fast and stable. This is today's roadmap of the topics we will cover. We will start out with the missing part of the rendering equation, the BSDF, which up until now we replaced with something constant in our examples. We will first look at its definition and how we can model the reflection of diffuse materials. Afterwards, we will do a short recap of last time's recursive rendering equation definition and see how we can implement it in software. This brings us directly to our first path tracing routine, which is capable of generating indirect lighting effects for diffuse objects. Afterwards, we will look at how we can bring specular materials, Russian roulette, and something called next event estimation together for a decent path tracer that has more features and is more stable than our first version. Along the way, you should ponder and find answers to some fundamental questions like, what is indirect illumination and why is it important? How can we realize multiple light bounces in a scene? What even is a path and how is it defined? And what other effects could we possibly add to our path tracer? So now that we know our goal, let's start at the beginning with the formal definition of the BSDF. The full name of the BSDF is the Bidirectional Scattering Distribution Function, and it's the part of the rendering equation highlighted here that so far we just ignored or replaced with something constant in examples. The job of the BSDF is to describe the transport of light by a material. Specifically, the result of the function, as it is written right here, is the amount of incoming irradiance from a direction omega that is passed on to a different direction v at a surface point x. In our case, for the rendering function, v will represent the ray that we followed to get to a hit point x, and omega is the next direction we will be looking at. In the case of direct lighting, which we saw before, v would be the view ray, x the point the view ray hits in the scene, and omega would be the direction we follow to find the light source or not. This term opens up a whole new universe of options because, as we mentioned, its job is to represent the light transport characteristics of materials. And there are as many different behaviors for this as there are materials out there. Some of them are translucent, some of them are shiny, some of them absorb most of the light they receive, some of them reflect all of it. So this is potentially a big topic, but for now we will only look at a subset of effects that the BSDF can model. For now we will only consider materials where light is either absorbed, that is lost in transport, or reflected at or immediately below the surface. So no particle scattering, translucency, subsurface scattering or similar. We will visit those at another time. But for now, we only stay with those simple materials, for which it suffices to define a relatively simple BRDF, a bidirectional reflectance distribution function. The BRDF as a concept is a subset of the BSDF and is usually what we start out with when introducing the topic of materials. The BRDF has several important properties. It is parameterized by two directions and gives the portion of light that, when coming from one direction, is reflected to the other by the material. It is a convention to always use directions that point away from the point at which we evaluate the BRDF to evaluate it. Here we have the formal definition of the BRDF and you can verify for yourself that it is the missing piece to plug into the rendering equation to balance the outgoing radiance with the incoming integral. 
The order of the vectors with which the BRDF is parameterized does not matter. BRDFs should ensure the Helmholtz reciprocity, that is, if a certain percentage of light coming from omega i is reflected to omega o, the same amount would be reflected from direction omega o to omega i. Finally, for physically plausible renderings, the BRDF must ensure that it does not add energy to the scene. So the sum of reflected light must not surpass the amount of incoming light. The BRDF ensures this if, for any direction v, the integral over the entire hemisphere of the BRDF times the cosine of theta is smaller than 1. Now this requirement is important, but it might not be too intuitive in its formulation. So let's have another look at it. We just learned that a BRDF should support reciprocity, meaning the portion of light reflected from A to B is also the portion of light reflected from B to A. Thanks to the reciprocity, there are two ways that we can read this. We can use the BRDF in the rendering function where it is supposed to be used. In the first interpretation, the amount of light that is reflected from X into one direction V from all possible directions omega must accumulate to one. Perhaps the more intuitive interpretation is that a certain amount of light, for example, from a laser light that arrives at X from a given direction V can be scattered in all directions. The total percentage of reflected light from that laser that observers around X will be able to see, according to the rendering equation, is the integral over the hemisphere of the BRDF times the cosine of theta. If this yields more than one, it means that the observers see more than 100% of the incoming light, and this violates energy conservation. We generally distinguish three different types of BRDFs. Not that this is not yet entirely physical correct, but rather a widely accepted convention to categorize materials by their approximate appearance. Those that more or less evenly scatter incoming light in all possible directions are referred to as diffuse. A perfectly diffuse BRDF is uniform for all possible pairs of directions. Materials that reflect light only in a very small range of directions, that is, they mostly mirror light, are referred to as specular. A perfect mirror reflects any incoming light only in the mirror direction. The last group are glossy materials. They have qualities of both diffuse and specular materials, that is, a certain amount of light is scattered in all directions, but highlights can be seen from directions where incident light is mirrored. Note that for specular and glossy materials, the shape of the BRDF actually depends on the vector v, that is, for our purposes, the direction from which a view ray arrived at its current hit point. Here we have three example renderings of the Ajax bust with those BRDFs. One with a perfectly diffuse BRDF, one with a perfectly specular BRDF, that is a mirror surface, and one with a glossy BRDF. We can easily see the differences in their light distribution properties. Diffuse materials almost have a certain basic ambient brightness because most surfaces reflect some of the light in all directions, but they completely lack highlights. On the other hand, specular BRDFs only mirror any incoming light and don't show any scattering at all. The glossy BRDF shows both of these effects, but to a lesser extent. Before, when we talked about picking a new direction for sampling the hemisphere, we always considered this to be its own methodology, and we discussed several different methods. We talked about uniform sampling and cosine weighted sampling, but it actually makes a lot of sense to fuse this concept with the BRDF in a render implementation and extend our scenes to define BRDFs for each mesh. Why is that? We know that the result of the BRDF evaluation depends on the point x, direction v, and direction omega. At each hit point x, we could simply check the corresponding mesh and fetch its material BRDF. As we saw in the previous lectures, 
it's safe to assume that our rendering will converge faster if the distribution of omega actually matches the shape of the BRDF times the cosine of theta, which, as we know now, goes by the name of importance sampling. The part of the rendering equation that we cannot easily predict is the incoming light Li, but what we can predict is the remaining factors, the BRDF and the cosine of theta. So it is a good idea to do important sampling based on that. If we were to put the BRDF in charge of generating our outgoing directions omega, we could leave it to the BRDF implementation to pick directions for important sampling its shape times the cosine of theta. So the BRDF would be in charge of sampling and reporting the PDF of samples it generated. This has many benefits. For one, important sampling can get messy, so it's good not to have it in our path tracing code. On the other hand, not all BRDFs might be easy to important sample. So in cases where this is impossible or not necessary, we could let certain BRDFs do rejection sampling or uniform sampling or something completely different without us having to touch the path tracing routine itself, but abstract it away into the BRDF class instead. Let's quickly check how we could implement a diffuse material with important sampling. Let's consider a material with a diffuse color rho. Color means that the RGB values of rho tell us how much of the light in each channel is reflected. Those values must be less than one. Due to energy conservation and the definition of rho, we know that the integral of the BRDF times cosine of theta over the whole hemisphere must equal rho in each color channel. Either by solving the math once more yourself or by building on the results from previous lectures, we can choose the BRDF to be rho over pi for any pair of directions in the hemisphere around the normal. Note that this is exactly what we used for color in our previous examples for direct lighting or ambient occlusion. So now we see that we actually used a diffuse BRDF back then already without knowing it. But what we also saw back then was a way to make sampling for this simple uniform BRDF more effective. If the BRDF is uniform, then the only thing that we can predict and that varies in our rendering equation is the cosine of theta. So to important sample the BRDF times the cosine of theta, all we have to do is use cosine weighted hemisphere sampling. This means that we can bring an old, familiar concept and a new concept together. And by combining them, we make things easier for ourselves. Our diffuse BRDF, in order to do important sampling, should look like this. We have a method sample that, regardless of input vector v, generates a cosine weighted sample in the hemisphere around normal n. Evaluation is easy. The BRDF is uniformly rho over pi in all directions in the hemisphere around n. Lastly, it should return a PDF for given samples. We already know that this is simply the cosine of the angle theta of omega divided by pi. In the path tracing procedure, we can then use the values that these methods generate, much like before, to hide the important sampling in the BRDF. We will see it being used in code shortly, but before we make it part of our path tracing routine, we must write our path tracing routine. So let's quickly recap the main takeaways from last time and then continue to put them into code. When we talk about rendering and generating realistic images, things start to get interesting once we go beyond direct lighting and start to consider light that arrives at surfaces after multiple bounces, or so-called indirect illumination. Indirect illumination makes a ton of difference. On the left-hand side, we see a rendering with 500 samples per pixel and direct lighting only. On the right-hand side, we have added additional bounces. Notice that the scene is brighter, we can see clear examples of color bleeding, and it looks much less artificial than the image on the left. In real-time graphics and renderers based on rasterization, developers and engineers struggle to achieve these effects. With path tracing routines, these effects come almost naturally 
you will see that the change that we have to make to a direct light renderer in order to get these effects going is very small. But first, let's revisit the key insights from last time. The rendering equation that gives us the total light that we can observe from a certain direction at the surface point X is governed by the light that the surface emits plus the light it reflects from other directions. We know that one way to solve this is to evaluate the incoming light recursively because there is an equality between the light that is received at point x1 from point x2 in one direction and the light that is reflected at point x2 in the opposite direction. This means that if we want to evaluate the received light from direction omega1 at point x1, we need only evaluate the reflectance function at point x2 in the opposite direction omega2. So with this in mind, we can now implement our new path tracing routine, which already makes use of the diffuse PRDF concept to simplify the code. We will approach this based on pure and simple hemisphere sampling. The first part is the same procedure as for direct lighting. Find a hit point in the scene and, if it is a light source, add the emitted light to the total radiance. Instead of generating a sample explicitly and defining a color, we now leave the sampling BRDF value and PEF computation all to the BRDF of the mesh that we hit. This is just a fancier version of things we have already seen. Notice that we use the inverse direction of the ray to parameterize the BRDF. This is because, as we said before, we always use vectors that point away from the surface when we work with the BRDF. Since the ray that got us here points towards X, we must invert it first. Before, for hemisphere sampling, this is the part where we would have shot a ray in some direction and see if we hit a light source with it. But now comes the important difference. The one line which actually just calls the function that we are currently in recursively. Since we will be calling this function recursively, we also introduce a recursion limit that allows us to control the number of bounces that we will follow. You can verify for yourself that in the case of a single bounce, this will simply yield the same result as we would have gotten with hemisphere sampling and direct lighting in our earlier routine. But for more bounces than one, we will see some great indirect illumination from this. Here we see the new routine and resulting rendered image. With the maximum recursion depth of one, as we just said, the results are identical to a direct lighting rendering routine. But with each new recursion, we get an additional bounce and more indirect light. Notice that we change the recursion limit on the left from one to two. Look at the areas indicated by the arrows and how we can now find light that was previously not there, which ended up in new locations only after an additional bounce. With yet another bounce, the effects are more subtle, but still noticeable. We see especially some brightening in the dark corners and some color bleeding in shadows. Basically light that is caused by the reflection of a reflection. And with each new bounce, the effects we see become more complex and more intricate. And with that, we have already passed our first milestone. We have implemented the knowledge that we acquired in the past few lectures and put it to practice in our first version of a basic diffuse material path tracer. Now would be a good time to reflect on what we did so far, but you might be eager to check out what else we can do with this path tracing routine and how we can extend it further. And so what we are going to do is continue to enhance our scene a bit. We are going to define the methods for the specular BRDF and then plug it right into our scene. We will look at the purely specular or mirror BRDF to add as a feature to our scene and path tracer. For this BRDF, the incoming light is completely reflected in the direction V if it comes from the mirrored direction around the normal. The mirror direction has the same angle towards the normal as V, 
but lies on the opposite side of the hemisphere. We denote such a perfect mirror direction of a vector v as rv. Light is only reflected by the surface in a single direction, so for any combination of directions that are not mirrored versions of each other, the BRDF is zero. This distribution is simple enough, but it leaves us with a problem. We cannot sample it like we did for the diffuse BRDF. If we have a given V, then we cannot simply use uniform or even cosine weighted hemisphere sampling or something similar, because the chances that we will hit the exact mirror direction of V are infinitely small. If we want to get reasonable results, we actually have to use a special method for sampling this specular BRDF. To do this, we first try to see if this particular behavior can be expressed with a formal distribution. The solution to this is the Dirac delta function. It is actually a perfect fit for the behavior we are trying to describe here. Formally, the Dirac delta function delta of x is defined to be zero everywhere except at x equals zero. For our purposes and given a vector v, we can use a shifted version of the delta function delta v of omega, which is zero everywhere except at omega equals the mirror direction of v rv. If we can import and sample this distribution, then we should never get a direction that is different from rv, because all other directions would have probability zero. To make this a valid PDF for sampling, we must ensure that the integral over the hemisphere is one, of course. This is ideal in theory. There's just one question that you might want to ponder for a moment. What actually is the value of delta v at rv? This will come back to us in a minute, but first let's check if we can make a valid BRDF from the delta function. We already have reciprocity because the mirror direction of rv is again v, so we only have to check for energy conservation. We actually want to have a complete mirror BRDF, so no light is absorbed or scattered, meaning that for a vector v, the entire radiance from its mirror direction is passed on. If we integrate the incoming irradiance from all directions times the BRDF over the entire hemisphere, we want to get exactly the light from the mirror direction. Let's see if that works with the BRDF candidate that we just found, the delta function. We know that the integral of our delta function over the entire hemisphere must be one. We also know that it will be zero everywhere except at rv, so the result of the integral must be the light from rv times the cosine of theta at rv. But this means that we lost some light due to the cosine term. Therefore, we compensate for this by defining the values of our BRDF as the delta function of v divided by the cosine of theta for the mirror direction. This way, all the light that comes from one direction is passed on in the mirror direction by the BRDF. So since we know the PDF that we want to use, the delta function of v and the actual BRDF values, we can try to implement the same functions as we did for the diffuse BRDF in code. The sampling method is easy. If we have a given vector v and normal n, the only sample that we can generate with the delta distribution is the mirror direction of v. But for the other methods, we face a problem. We are supposed to evaluate the BRDF for any two vectors. Remember that what we should return here is the ratio of the irradiance that derives on the surface from one direction and is reflected as radiance to the other. This is easy when the two vectors are not mirrored versions of each other. But what if they are? Here the question comes back what actually is the value of the delta function at the mirror direction. The answer is it's something that tends towards infinity. The same is true for the PDF function, which leaves us in an awkward situation. The only reasonable way to go here is to make sure that the evaluate and the PDF functions are always used together, because in that case the delta function cancels out. Luckily, this will be our main use case for the path tracing routine anyway. So we will make another change to our path tracing method, that is, since we always use the evaluation of the BRDF and the PDF together anyway, we just combine them into a single function. 
This makes even more sense if we remember that all the steps from the original loop that we can save in computation if we have important sampling in our BRDFs. In the diffuse BRDF, the cosine of theta cancels out in important sampling, and in the specular BRDF, we only have one direction to pick for sampling. The PDF cancels out, and so does the cosine of theta. So really, making a single function that takes care of computing a sample and a single multiplication value for the rendering equation makes things a lot easier. We will modify our BRDFs to support such a function that produces a sample omega and the multiplier for the incoming radians that may or may not contain a cosine or a PDF value. With this in mind, we go back to the specular BRDF and take a closer look at its updated version. We will now assume that any operation that actually wants to find the proper mirror direction for an input will do that by using the new sample method, which for a given unit vector v gives rv. We will also assume that no function other than sample can simply guess the perfect reflection direction. This makes things easier in code for us, because we can simply ignore the infinity values and just always return zero for the evaluation of BRDF directions and the PDF alike. The new version of our recursive path tracer looks like this. The BRDF takes care of picking a sample direction and corresponding multiplier for all indirect light that we find in that sample direction. Since we can use this method on both diffuse and specular BRDFs, we can now update our scene description and add some specular objects to it. Here we have made the two spheres from before with a fully specular mirror BRDF. We are again only computing a single bounce, so all they mirror is the light source itself for now. But after a second bounce, we see the same improvements as before on the diffuse materials, but now our mirroring objects show reflections of objects in the scene. Note that the reflections are one bounce behind. The spheres in the reflections are still black. This is because two bounces is just enough to hop from one sphere to the other and then to the light source, but not more. So all colors of the surrounding walls don't show up in the reflections of the reflections, if you know what I mean. But adding one more bounce helps. Now we can even see colors being reflected in the reflections of the spheres. If this makes your head spin a bit, that's okay. But just notice that with every bounce, our scene becomes more visually pleasing and, important to notice, more complete. Now we have seen one to three bounces and the difference they make. The question is, however, how many bounces are enough? Remember that for an unbiased rendering method, every possible path that has a probability that is non-zero has to be taken by the renderer with some non-zero probability. A light path only has a 0% chance of continuing when all the photons have been absorbed. but no material on Earth actually absorbs 100% of the incoming light. So that means no matter how many bounces, the probability of a light ray continuing never goes to zero. That means for a fully unbiased path tracer, you cannot put a limit on the number of bounces. And we can easily fulfill this requirement in our code. But it also means that our renderer now becomes unusable, since it might never finish, for instance, if you are tracing rays from light in a closed room. So what can we do about that? It is important to remember that most of the light that we as observers notice comes from the first few bounces. In some cases, especially when we have specular materials, light that is reflected over seven or more bounces can still make a significant difference but those cases are rather rare. So in order to limit our runtime, could we maybe implement something that makes these long paths still possible, but unlikely? This is where Russian roulette comes in. 
And this method is actually very fittingly named because it describes the method perfectly. The longer you go on, the more likely you are to get terminated, which is exactly the policy that we will be implementing for our race. Russian roulette in path tracing works as follows. You first decide on the probability for continuing array. Then draw a random variable. If its value is below the continuation probability, the ray gets to continue for another bounce. Otherwise, the ray ends. Thus, the longer it goes on, the higher the chances of a ray being terminated. But the ray could still go on forever, so the method is unbiased. The longer a path gets, the higher is the contribution from its final color value. In theory, we want paths to be as long as possible, but since we can't compute this, we make sure that the impact of the long paths compensates for them being so rare by weighing them with the reciprocal of their probability. That means if an infinitely long path were to ever occur, its impact on the color values would also be infinitely high. Now you may ask, is it safe to have a program that in theory could still be running forever? And the answer is yes, it's fine because it will almost certainly not happen. If you choose your probability p as a reasonable value, it is much more likely to get a universal unique ID collision than that ever happening. So you might think, okay, the smaller I choose p, the earlier the paths will terminate. The faster I get my output image, and it is still unbiased. So let's just pick a very small p and be done with it. Well, that's not exactly the case. Let's look at the rendering where we use Russian roulette with a survival probability of 0.95. We take 500 samples per pixel and get a total runtime of 260 seconds with a decent image quality. Now let's compare that to a fixed survival probability of 0.6. The rendering is much faster, but it is also much noisier. So if you want to create a good quality image with this Russian roulette setting, we must increase the number of samples. If we pull the number of samples up to triple of the original, the runtime is now a bit slower than it was even with the high survival probability, but the quality has increased as well. If we now put the two renderings, one generated with high survival probability and few samples, and one with low survival probability and many samples side by side, we see that the one on the right has some characteristic unsightly artifacts, tiny bright spots in the shadows that make the image on the right objectively worse than the one on the left, even though it took us slightly longer to compute it. This is something that we already mentioned before. Because the survival probability is low, the probability of multi-bounce paths also becomes low, irregardless of whether or not they can still add a significant amount of color to the image. But as we know from multiple importance sampling, if the value of a sample has a high intensity, but its probability is low, that means we are increasing variance and therefore noise. Those rare samples, because they are so rare, get a high contribution and show up as dark or bright spots that are hard to get rid of, even with many additional samples. They are also colloquially referred to as fireflies. So now we know that the choice of the proper Russian roulette survival probability is important and should neither be too high nor too low. In fact, a good idea is to pick the survival probability at each bounce depending on the remaining throughput of the samples so that we can reduce the occurrence of fireflies. To do this, we can simply keep track of the total remaining throughput after all bounces so far and use it as a probability. That way, the probability of a path continuing for another bounce corresponds directly to the intensity that it can still deliver. As a final word on Russian roulette, there are some things to make it more stable and effective that we can easily add. First, we must notice that some materials might still have a high or perfect reflection, which could impact the influence of Russian roulette. 
So we should make sure that the survival probability gradually decreases. For instance, by bounding each bounce's survival probability with 0.99 from above. Second, it is often advisable to have a minimum bounce depth in our path tracer before Russian roulette takes effect. For instance, a good idea is to make sure that the first two to three bounces always happen before Russian roulette kicks in and may terminate the ray. If we make these changes, we find that we get a decent rendering result that is now unbiased. Already we have come quite far compared to direct lighting. But what about all that noise that we see here? Before we talk about how we can combat noise in our path tracer, let's first make a short detour and think about what a path actually is. If we know our initial state and the exact rendered scene, we can easily reproduce any path based on the random variables that we drew along it. So in fact, we can see every path in our path tracer as a multidimensional random sample or vector where each event for which we need a random value is its own dimension. The more bounces we make, the higher the dimension of our random sample. Thankfully, Monte Carlo integration does not mind working with high dimensional samples and integrals. In the main loop of our renderer, the Monte Carlo integral still works and is computed as the average of a sum. But we do pay for all those additional dimensions with more noise that is introduced into our renderings. So what are some of the possible dimensions of our multidimensional path tracing samples? We already know some of them. For instance, the starting location on the pixel that we send the ray through, the construction of a new ray after each bounce, and so on. But there are other interesting effects that we can also consider. And if we want to support them in our path tracing, all we have to do is add them as additional dimensions to our path tracing samples. Some popular examples of this multidimensional path tracing include depth of fields or motion blur effects. We will quickly look at how something like this could be achieved. For a depth of field effect, we can simulate the focal length of a specific camera lens. The way to do this in a path tracer is to first create a ray through the pixel, as we did before, but then choose a focal point along the ray at a fixed distance f. Next, we pick an origin on a disk at distance 0, which simulates the lens of the camera, and then trace the ray from the origin location through the focal point into the scene. This effectively adds a circle of confusion for objects depending on their distance from the focal plane. The second effect for multidimensional path tracing that we show here is motion blur. Here we just have one extra dimension, which is time. In order to support this, the intersection with acceleration structures and geometry in the scene must be parameterized with a random variable that indicates the time at which the ray was shot. If we want to render a scene that was recorded over the range of a second, it would be in the range from 0 to 1, and all intersection tests should be performed according to the movement of objects over time. This way, rays that are shot in the same directions will be hitting different triangles depending on which time t was chosen for the multidimensional sample. All these multidimensional effects, multiple bounces, depth of field, area light positions, and so on, are impressive, but are also responsible for creating noise in our renderings. So how can we get rid of it? The simplest method that always applies is to just use more samples. But if we don't have infinite compute power, we might want to look for other ways to improve quality. We are already important sampling the BRDFs, and that is a good start. But we also saw previously that hemisphere sampling is often not the best idea. We have been looking at light source sampling before. What if we can bring it back, but recursively? This is what we call next event estimation, and it is the final stop on today's agenda 
towards our updated path tracer. In the next few slides, we will go over the underlying idea and how we can implement it as part of our path tracing routine. Let's assume a simple scene with a single area light. After the first view array has hit a point in the scene, there are two ways in which light can arrive at this current hit point. Light can either come from a point that is not a light source, in which case we might get some indirect illumination, or it comes from a light source directly, which would account for direct illumination. Note that during simple hemisphere sampling, each of these locations would be a possible hit for the ray to land on in the next bounce. If we look at all the places that light can come from, we can map out directions on the hemisphere that will create direct or indirect light for the current hit point. Remember that what light source sampling essentially does, if it succeeds, is projecting the area of the light source onto the hemisphere. If we perform light source sampling, we can collect the direct illumination from the entire light source, thus taking care of that portion of the hemisphere. We can then shoot an indirect sample that goes to a location where it might collect indirect illumination in the next bounce. If we do this recursively, we basically get next event estimation. The projection of the light source on the hemisphere is accounted for at each bounce and indirect illumination will be accounted for by light source sampling from the following bounces. In the path tracing routine, all that we need to do is add up the results from light source sampling and from recursive hemisphere sampling. That way we will be projecting light sources for direct light and leave the selection of qualified directions for indirect sampling to the BRDF and its importance sampling. Of course, if you paid close attention to the previous lectures, something should not sit right with you. If we combine light source sampling and hemisphere sampling and simply add them up, won't we get twice the light for the scene? And you would be right. We assumed here that our indirect samples would not be hitting the light source, but there is nothing that keeps them from actually doing so. And we also don't want them to avoid light sources. A light source itself might be receiving some light from elsewhere. Consider a strong spotlight shining onto a weak area light. That would be some significant indirect illumination right on a light source. So what can we do to avoid adding up double the light in the scene? Remember that in hemisphere sampling, we used to set the emittance whenever we hit a light source. But now, light source sampling takes care of all the light from light sources for us. So perhaps we could just set the emittance in the rendering equation to zero. The new version of our code looks like this. We added some placeholders for code that you already know and the portions that implement Russian roulette termination. Notice first of all that we have disabled emittance completely. We now have two separate direction samples, one generated by the light source and one by the BRDF. We first evaluate the light source sample to get direct lighting. Notice that since this sample was not generated from the BRDF, we have to go the old way of evaluating the incoming radiance by applying the full formula for direct light source sampling. Note that in this case, the differential area of the light source, cosine at the light source sample location and squared distance are all already packed into the returned radiance value. All we have to do is evaluate the BRDF for the sample direction and multiply with the local cosine of beta. The rest of the function is as before. We recursively perform sampling over multiple bounces based on a sample that we got from the BRDF. Finally, we add together the results for direct and indirect lighting and return their sum. We have pretty much achieved what we have set out to do, and that is reduce noise 
but actually we have done too much. By disabling emittance completely, we have lost some effects that are vital. The reflections of light sources are gone, the light source itself has no more brightness, and even some of the caustics are missing now. Where did we go wrong? We are already pretty close. We just need to make minor modifications for two cases where we can't afford to lose emittance because next event estimation has failed. When we first shoot our initial ray into the scene, there was no previous bounce on the pixel surface where we could have computed direct lighting. So we will need to allow adding emittance the first time that we hit a point in the scene. Also remember that for specular materials, there is only one direction that ever reflects any light. This means that light source sampling on a fully specular material will always fail. The only way that specular materials can get direct illumination is by checking for emittance, that is, whether we arrive at the light source, after the next bounce in the mirror direction. Accounting for these two special cases is easy enough and should fix our issues. And here we have the finished result. Recursive path tracing with diffuse and specular materials plus potentially infinite bounces with Russian roulette and next event estimation. And if you compare this to what we started out with today, direct lighting only, this is an obvious improvement. So now we are finally at the point where we can have some serious fun with our renderer. And we leave it to you to do some experimentation and rendering different scenes with the features that we discussed today. But something that we glossed over today entirely are the glossy BRDFs. Remember that we mentioned three different BRDF types in the beginning, but we only covered two? That is because for glossy materials, the math gets a bit more involved and it's difficult to make them physically correct. Also, we never even looked at the other terms of light scattering. Today, we only looked at the reflection of light. For the full BSDF, we should go a bit more into detail and we will do that in an upcoming lecture on materials. Until then, we thank you for sticking around until the end and we hope to also see you next time.